Hello and welcome. My name is Micah Silverman and today I'm going to be talking to you about centralizing authentication and authorization with Kong and Okta. Quick little bit about me. Here's some background. I am staff security hacker at Okta. I co-authored Mastering Enterprise Java Beans just in time for that technology to become irrelevant. I contribute to a number of open source projects including the Java JSON Web Token project and I contribute regularly to Okta's blog, including this reference here on an OpenID Connect primer in case you're interested. Now, just to be clear, where I'm not an expert is in Docker, Kong, Lua, and security. We're going to be talking about all of those today. Where I am expert is in Java, Spring Boot, breaking shit in general, especially around APIs, networking protocols, and security, and expert in security. And if you notice that security is there twice, security is a very broad field and there are some things that I'm pretty good at and some things I know nothing about, so I put those in both categories. So let's talk a little bit about Kong. Kong is all about having a centralized API gateway and it provides services on top of it for things like logging and authentication, rate limiting and routing and it's a very modern way to manage your RESTful API. It also is open source and they have a, an enterprise edition as well, but you can get started with Kong totally free forever because it's open source. Now, why would you even want Kong? Well, let's take a look at our first network diagram here. I'm focusing on modern authentication for web applications and for API APIs that's often using OpenID Connect. Now a deep dive into OpenID Connect is a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but suffice it to say that OpenID Connect allows you to securely identify yourself to a, a website or a service without having to give your credentials to that service. So you have a centralized what's called authorization server and that's over here, that's Okta. And then you have one or more services or web applications that are clients to that service provider. And you've probably experienced this most frequently with Google or with Apple where you say you go to Gmail and you go to log in, you're redirected over to Google centralized authorization server. That's where you provide your credentials. And then you're redirected back to say Gmail or one of Google's other authorization uh, or one of Google's other services. The nice thing about that architecture is that the Gmail team at Google doesn't have to do deal with credentials and storing them safely. They just have to deal with Gmail and Google's authorization team manages all of the credentials and you get a good separation of concerns. So here's kind of what you might experience with a normal architecture. Let's say you have a microservices architecture or even uh, a single website, but one that you want to replicate across um, a uh, high availability zone. And so maybe you have multiple instances of that. And then you'll have some sort of a load balancer or gateway in front of it all. So you can see here we have a request coming into allthethings.com. And you may be routed and redirected through any of these different services. And then you're going to be sent over to the authorization server to go and identify yourself. This is fine. This is a good, um, a good architecture. The, the, the challenge here is that each one of these services or each one of these websites has to have an entire OpenID Connect client stack set up with them. And if things change or need to be updated, you have to do it in a, in a lot of places. If you need to add more services, you need to make sure that the OpenID Connect stack is there for all those services. What having a centralized Kong gateway allows us to do is then it's Kong that's interacting, only Kong that's interacting with our OpenID Connect provider, which is Okta in this case. And then Kong sends through an assertion on the X user info header to each of the services or inside websites. And that allows these stacks to be a lot leaner. Now, your stack only needs to know how to interpret and process an X user info header and then it will be able to identify who the, the authenticated user is and um, 
be able to manage an, an identity going forward that way. So you can have a much leaner stack. You only have one entity that's interacting with uh, a service provider at any given time. Now there's a couple of things that we need to tend to in this architecture, in the Kong centralized gateway architecture. One is that inside services should only ever accept connections from the API gateway. So we don't want our we don't want our interior services able to accept connections from the public internet because anybody could then spoof an X user info header and then that would uh, eliminate the security that we have in place. So all inside services must only accept connections from the API gateway and inside services must use the custom header, the X user info header as a security assertion. So as far as these services are concerned or individual websites if the x user info is present and formatted in an expected way that's equivalent to a user having identified themselves securely now let's talk a little bit about docker as i said i am not an expert but i know enough to get myself into trouble and the example that we're going to go through in a little bit takes advantage of docker in a couple of important ways one is that you can have an internal network set up in Docker and you can configure very precisely what can get through that network and what cannot. This helps us to manage uh, rule one here. So our inside service, which is gonna be a Spring Boot app, we'll see that in just a little bit, will only accept connections from our Kong API gateway. Also, the Kong API gateway is going to allow connections from the outside world and we, we manage all of that through this internal network. It also makes it, because there are some moving parts to this infrastructure, we have our Spring Boot and Spring Security app, we have Kong, we have a database that Kong relies on. Using Docker allows us to uh, keep things very manageable and I'm going to run this entire infrastructure on my laptop that I'm presenting from and I can set up and tear this whole thing down very quickly. So here's what our Docker infrastructure is going to look like for the purpose of this example. First of all, if you notice, port 8080, which is what our Spring Security, uh, Spring Boot application runs on, that's going to be blocked from the outside world. I can't get there directly. However, port 8000, that's the default port that Kong is going to listen on, we can get there from the outside world. Internally, we have this OctaCon bridge network and all of these different players, all of these different entities can, can communicate with each other across this network, but it does not have access from the outside world, direct access. So the Kong gateway is gonna be able to speak to our Spring Boot app and it's also gonna be able to speak to the Cassandra database to manage uh, its internal state and, and other things that it uh, requires. So here, the Kong gateway is then going to be able to connect to Spring Boot on port 8080 and pass along that security assertion. X user info is the, uh, the, the header that's going to come across. All right, so let's take a look at this in action, and then we'll go through a little bit of the code and talk about how all these moving parts work together. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is fire up our Kong gateway and there's a lot going on in this command so let's take a look at it now prior to this presentation I built an image called OctaCon OIDC that image can be built completely from the github repo that I'm gonna share with you at the end of this presentation so that you can run this locally if you want so I've taken a few shortcuts I've already built the images now we're just gonna run the containers and this is some Docker speak if you're not familiar with it. Docker is this kind of big container ship. We build images that can be used and then we uh, create containers from those images which are running kind of virtual machines. I also already created the OctaCon bridge that I spoke about earlier. So you can see right here, we're referencing that OctaCon bridge. That's the network that it's gonna be using. We're also calling out the OpenID Connect plugin, which this image contains, and this is gonna activate it once we fire up this container. It's gonna use the Cassandra database, and then we have a couple of other uh, environment variables for Kong, uh, 
This one is important here. Kong has an admin API that listens on port 8001. And ordinarily, we would not expose this to the outside world because it's the, the uh, an API that controls Kong's admin. But for purposes of demonstration, I am going to expose it to the outside world. And I do that by telling it to uh, listen on port 8001 and by exposing port 8001 with this uh, command. Finally, this is the image that I'm referencing on uh, Okta Kong OIDC. So let's kick that off. So now this is running, and I ran it in an interactive mode so that we can just see uh, the output and what's happening there. And if we take a look, this is my, I don't know if I can make this bigger. It doesn't look like I can. But this is the uh, Kong, or rather the Docker interface on Mac. And you can see that I have this Kong database running. That's a running container. And now I have the OctaKong OIDC container running. So we've got uh, some of the parts of our infrastructure here that we just discussed. right? So right now we have the Kong Gateway and we have Cassandra. The, the last piece we're going to run here is our Spring Boot application. And that also is an image that uh, I created, and we're going to run it inside a container. We could just run it locally. We could run all of this locally. But having it run in a container uh, keeps everything nice and neat. It also sets up the networking in a way that, that we want to. So here I'm running this uh, thing called the header origin example. I'm using the same Octacong bridge. And I already have the header origin example image. And if you're familiar with Spring Boot, you may recognize this splash screen. So it's running the Spring Boot application. And uh, we can see here that it's listening on port 8080. OK, so now let's just take a look and see what we have running here. We can see in Docker, I have three containers that are running. I have the Spring Boot app. I have OctaKong, or I have this image, this container called OctaKong. That's our Kong server. It also shows us open ports. So here's 8000 to 8001. And I also have the Kong database, which is our uh, Cassandra database. That was uh, previously set up as well. All right, the next thing we're going to do now is to establish some uh, services and routes. So right now, we have these uh, three pieces. We have the Kong Gateway, Cassandra, and Spring Boot. And Kong and Spring Boot are not connected in any way right now. So an incoming request to the Kong Gateway doesn't know where to go right now. So we're going to establish that using some Kong API commands. And uh, I'm also going to use some, some shortcuts here. So I'll show you exactly what's going on. First thing I'm going to do is set this thing I'm calling service ID. Now what it's doing is it's submitting a form to the services endpoint. And it's giving it a URL. And so this is the URL to our header origin on port 8080. It's and it's giving this service a name, OctaSecure. And then I'm piping the output through a little tool called JQ, which is a JSON parser. The result of this call is JSON. I'm pulling out this unique ID for the service, and I'm assigning it to the service ID environment variable. This is a little shortcut, because for the next command, we've defined the service. Now I'm going to call the Kong admin API and add a route. And I'm basically saying for all paths, that is slash, I want to take advantage of this service and uh, route it to the service. So all paths starting with slash are going to be routed to the, the Spring Boot example. Let me do that. That will also be a JSON response. And we can see that this uh, has its own unique ID as well. And we can see that it's covering all of these paths. Now, it's worth taking a step back here. For the purposes of example, I've put together a Spring Boot web app. Now, Kong, we think of is a, a, a centralized API gateway. So for purposes of demonstration, I just set this up as a simple website. But this approach would work just as well 
for a cluster of uh, disparate microservices that were sitting behind the API gateway. All right, so now we've set up our route. Anything coming into um, Kong at port uh, 8000 will be sent over to the, uh, the Spring Boot application, the internal Spring Boot application on port 8080. Let's take a look at this uh, a little bit here. Let's just see what, what we have right now. I'm going to bring up an incognito window. First, I'm going to go to localhost 8080, and we can see that nothing that I, is accessible to me is listening on port 8080. Well, let's check out port 8000. We know that's going to send me over to the Spring Boot application. And now you can see that I'm getting this uh, 403 error because Kong is sending me over to the Spring Boot app, but I have not been authenticated in any way. And so therefore the app just rejects me. It's forbidden. Well, in order to fix that situation, we need to activate the OpenID Connect plugin with some specific information. So let me paste this command and we'll break this down just like we did the other one. So now I'm submitting a form using Kong's admin facility, admin service to the plugins endpoint. And the plugin I'm interested in configuring is OIDC. I need to give it a client ID and a client secret, which I previously set up. And I need to give it this thing called a discovery URL. And I'm going to pipe the output into JQ and I'm going to remove the client secret. That's what this DEL, I'm going to remove the client secret from the output because I don't want you all to see the client secret. But we can see that uh, this is now configured with a client ID and the discovery is an Okta URL because Okta supports OpenID Connect. And so now we've configured this OpenID Connect plugin for Kong and any incoming connections to Kong are gonna require that we've been properly set up with OpenID Connect. Let's see what that looks like. So I'm gonna go back to localhost 8000. I'm gonna go in one more time. Now I'm directed to Okta to authenticate. So far, so good. Now, before we continue and actually, well, let's do this. Let's see it in action. And then we'll talk about some of the mechanism of what's going on here behind the scenes. So let me go ahead and authenticate. I'm gonna, let me make this a little bigger. I'm gonna log in as this user called Joe User. I'm gonna sign in. Notice up top here, I'm over here in Okta world. I'm going to sign in, then I'm going to get redirected back to the app. And now the app recognizes that I am in an authenticated state. So it's addressing me by name, and now I have these other buttons, users only and admins only. I click on users only, and it shows me a list of the groups I belong to. And now notice if I click on admins only, I get this unauthorized page because I am not an admin. So Kong and, and my Spring Boot app are aware of not only my authentication, but also my authorization. That is the roles, the groups that, that I belong to. We'll look at one other quick one here. Let's jump back to port 8000. This time I'm gonna log in as Sally Admin. Okay, now it's, again, it's recognizing me by name. If I go to users, now I can see these are the groups that I belong to. And now if I go to admins only, I can get in there because I am a member of the admins group. So this kind of proves that everything is now working. Everything is hanging together. I can't get to the app directly. Uh, I can get to it via the Kong API gateway. That's where the OpenID Connect dance is happening and then it's passing along this internal assertion. And we can even see some of that in action if we jump back here to our output. If I scroll back just a little bit. Notice here, Kong is saying that it, it knows who I am and, and it's parsed this thing called an ID token. That's an open ID connect uh, uh, asset that you get back and it recognizes who I am and it has a list of groups. 
and it's going to pass that list of groups along. And we can even see in the Spring Boot output, looks like we got an error here, but somewhere in the Spring Boot output. So notice Spring Security detected this X user info header with a base64 URL encoded uh, value. It decoded that base64 value to this JSON, and now the application recognizes who I am because this assertion came in and it was able to to recognize it. All right, so let's take a look now at some of the code that backs all of this to, to see what's going on here. First, let's take a look at, at the Okta configuration because that's kind of what makes all this uh, hang together and work. So here we go. All right, so now in Okta, I can go and see that I have this application. I have a number of applications defined, but I have an application called Kong API Gateway. It has a client ID in secret, which I configured Kong with, and it also has assignments. So I have these users, uh, Joe User and Sally Admin, and I have these groups called Users and Admins, and I've assigned those groups to this application. So anybody who belongs to these groups can access this application. I also have an authorization server definition. And here's where things get interesting and in some of the power that, that Okta gives you. I have added some custom claims. Now we haven't talked about the details of OpenID Connect and we're not gonna get too far into the weeds here, but OpenID Connect sends back uh, a token called an ID token that identifies who the authenticated user is. And here I'm defining some additional information that I'm gonna add to that ID token. Most importantly, I'm adding a list of the groups that the authenticated user belongs to. And then I'm adding some individual details like a full name and the user's email. So that comes back in the ID token. And we saw that in the output here from uh, Kong, let's see if it didn't scroll away too far. So we saw that here that the ID token that's coming back, in addition to whatever else it might ordinarily include, it also includes this user full name, it includes user email, and it includes an array of the groups that the user belongs to. So this is the glue that makes everything hang together, this definition in Okta. And the only thing I need to give to Kong is this, um, this uh, issuer information. And over here in the application, I had to give it the client ID and the client secret. Now Kong knows how to speak to Okta because we're dealing with standards here. So it's not that Kong specifically knows how to speak to Okta, it's that Kong and Okta both speak OpenID Connect. Let's take a quick look at the code to round out our tour here. And this is very Java specific, but you could manage this sort of architecture with any language and framework. But the important bit here is that I've defined, for Spring Security, I've defined this custom filter. And the filter attempts to get a user from this class that I created called request context user. If it's able to find the user, then it sets the Spring Security context to say that, hey, there's an authenticated user. So we're hooking into the natural capabilities of Spring Security to indicate that uh, an authenticated user, uh, this app is now aware of an authenticated user because it was able to find the user. Now, here's where the magic happens with finding the user, and that is we have access to the HTTP request, and I have this uh, header that it's looking for, X user info, and so if that header is not null, then it's going to come here and it's going to base64 decode the X user info header. And then it's going to use the built-in Jackson mapper to take that JSON string 
and marshal it up into this user object. So between the re request context user and the filter, we're able to find a user if one exists. And then in our Spring Security uh, uh, security configuration, I simply add this filter into the stack of filters that are used to determine whether or not there's an authenticated user. So that's what makes it all hang together from the perspective of Spring Security. Last thing to look at here is uh, by default, all paths are secured, meaning you can't just get to there. We saw that before I had enabled the OpenID Connect, uh, Connect configuration in Kong, we saw that that was the case. If we look at this secure controller, we can see these endpoints. We have slash users and admins, and they all require authentication. But for users and admins, it's actually making use of, or it's adding the user, it's automatically injecting the found user into this method in the controller. And now we can add that user to our model. We're in the uh, world of model view controller here. And so then these resulting pages can show us information about that authenticated user. We'll take a very quick look at that. If we look at the roles template, if we look at the roles template, you'll notice that it's taking a look, it's iterating over the list of groups that the user belongs to, and it's showing us each of those, each uh, of the groups that the user belongs to. Let me find my place here. So that has been a brief whirlwind tour of using Kong and Okta together to centralize auth, that's both authentication and authorization for um, your, your Spring Boot apps. So I have a QR code here. You can get this presentation deck. You can get access to this video and to blog posts that I've uh, done about it. You can always tweet me at a fit nerd or tweet the whole developer advocacy team at Okta at Okta Dev. And I hope this has been instructive and we'll see you soon.